morning in British Columbia, in Saskatchewan, in Mexico City, in Oaxaca, in Yucatan, and in Cochabamba. And good afternoon to all of you who are joining us uh, from Europe and other parts of the world. It is for me a real pleasure to have been invited to moderate this extraordinary conversation across Turtle Island and Amyayala, the names that some of us indigenous scholars and activists give to the continent known as the Americas. I greet you from a different land and through a virtual platform, but I would like to start this meeting by acknowledging the historical company and spiritual inspiration that I draw from my ancestors, the Maya and my homeland, the Yucatan Peninsula. I invite our colleagues in Canada and Mexico to acknowledge also the land from where they are joining uh, with their voices and thoughts um, when they introduce themselves uh, later during this meeting. Um, I'm going to give the, um, uh, now the, the word to um, the um, uh, representative of the Canada uh, state in, in Mexico, uh, Chantal, uh, who is going to also um, say some uh, welcome words for this meeting. Muchas gracias, Henner, y muchas gracias a todos. Thank you very much, Henner. Thank you, everybody. Good morning. I'm speaking to you from Valle de Bravo here in Mexico. Thank you for joining us on this first edition of a series of conversations that we've organized at the Canadian Embassy in Mexico together with Global Voices through its Rising Voices Initiative in which we will be talking about the reality of indigenous languages in the digital ecosystem. I would like to begin by quoting the Zapotec poet and activist, Irma Pineda. She's a good friend of Canada who recently said the following within the context of a high level meeting of the UNESCO in which we spoke about the importance of establishing a decade for indigenous languages. And by the way, I think it's very opportune that we're talking about this subject today because yesterday a report was issued on the measures that will be taken for this decade of indigenous languages. Well, in any case, Irma said that when you lose a language, you lose the, the vision of the wisdom accumulated over the centuries and we have to find a, we also forget how to cure ourselves and how to live with nature i would like to thank all of the panelists piani matza Jenner yanis gerald lawson vicente canchemo and belinda daniels for participating in this event it's a pleasure to have you all here as you know this event was originally planned for autumn and we were supposed to hold this event in the state of Chiapas here in Mexico, but because of the health crisis that we're currently undergoing globally, we decided to undertake it online. And although a face-to-face -face conversation would have most probably contributed much more, we thought we could at least organize it online because that would help us to reach more people. Although the digital ecosystem has a lot of virtues, it is also a reflection of the injustice and the inequality that we see in our world. The 68 indigenous languages in Mexico and the 70 in Canada are underrepresented in digital media, which is why it's important for us to not just reflect upon, but also to be able to conduct actions that will help us to reduce that inequality, which is why the Canadian Embassy in Mexico has devoted a significant portion of its cultural efforts to strengthen the exchange of good practices and artistic collaboration, as well as the creation of peer networks amongst the indigenous peoples of Mexico and Canada. That way, the millennial traditions of our two countries which are at the root of our, both our countries will help us to find even more reasons to celebrate the relationship between our two countries. I hope that these conversations will be very fruitful for the attendees as well as the panelists and that this will strengthen the networks that we will establish between the activists and the speakers of indigenous languages in Mexico and Canada. We will always 
be in touch with you to see what other measures we can take in order to strengthen our rich and very diverse cultures. Thank you once again for joining us. Merci beaucoup. Muchas gracias. Henner, I'll grant you the floor. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to take this opportunity also uh, before we start with the, with the proper conversations, just to say uh, to um, members of the audience, uh, all of you colleagues and friends uh, who are joining us from different parts of the world, that uh, there's an option uh, provided by this platform, by Zoom, uh, as well as by the um, uh, co-organizers, Rising Voices and the Embassy of Canada in Mexico, uh, which is the uh, um, simultaneous interpretation tool. Um, you can choose the language in which you want to uh, listen to the to the conversations uh, during this uh, meeting by moving your cursor to the uh, bottom of your screen, and then uh, you'll see a, a globe, uh, like a planetary globe, uh, on the um, on the right hand side of your uh, bar, uh, and if you click on that, you can choose um, simultaneous interpretation in um, either English uh, or Spanish, you know, whatever language you are more comfortable with. Um, so, um, before we, we start, I just wanted to uh, thank again, uh, you know, the organizers of this event um, and for the invitation to, to moderate this, uh, this panel. Um, I am today wearing a red cotton shirt designed and manufactured by uh, Juchiteco people from, from Mexico, a Zapotec from Oaxaca. And as my brothers and sisters, we probably recognize red is the color of the sunrise, uh, the color of the east, and at least among us, Maya, it is also the color of extraordinary things. And I thought that it would be a great color to wear given this unusual exchange between indigenous language activists from Mexico and Canada, the one that we are having today. Um, and I also thought that it would be fitting uh, to the extraordinary uh, circumstances that we are facing as a planet these days. As I speak right now, the coronavirus disease that originated in 2019, or COVID-19 as uh, we have learned to call it, has infected officially more than 13.5 million people and kill nearly 600,000 in the world. In our continent, this disease brings back painful memories of another plague that hit us over 500 years ago, the pandemic of colonialism. As scientists and historians acknowledge today, that pandemic killed around 90% of the original population of the Americas in a period of approximately 100 years. The survivors of that great dying as a recent article of the Quaternary Science Reviews called it, uh, are still trying to regroup and reconstruct our story, our histories, our societies, and our languages. Uh, in, the midst of, in the midst of all this, COVID-19 has hit and continues affecting almost the entire planet. Unsurprisingly, it has affected the poorest, the most vulnerable and marginalized populations harder than the rest. Among these are, um, the First Nations and Indigenous Peoples of the Americas. People must be aware by now of the severity of the pandemic among the Navajo in the US, in the predominantly indigenous state of Amazonas in Brazil, among the Shipibo and Navajo peoples in Peru, and the Mapuche in Chile, to mention but a few examples. To be sure, these are not, these are not pretty times for our peoples, but then again, there have, been, there have been few pretty times in the last five centuries. And yet, in the middle of all this chaos, um, indigenous inventiveness and creativity continues to thrive. And this is what um, has brought us together uh, today, um, the uh, opportunity and the possibility of thinking together about the future of our heritages, uh, cultures, and languages um, uh, in the middle of this great chaos uh, that is prevailing uh, in the, today's world. Um, so, um, it's no time to be all doom. Um, we have uh, several reasons to be hopeful, and those are the ones that have brought us together today here in this virtual meeting. But it was, uh, I thought it was um, um, important to acknowledge that, um, you know, what is happening 
in uh, our communities and uh, territories today. So, um, we are going to start by uh, doing a round of introductions. And um, so we're going to start, uh, we're going to start from the top um, uh, northernmost uh, uh, corner of, uh, of the continent, uh, starting in British Columbia. Um, I'm going to pass on the word now to uh, our friend and brother, uh, Jerry Lawson, uh, for him to introduce himself. Hi, thank you so much. Um, uh, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I think we'll land probably a little bit further north, but uh, we'll go with it. Uh, so I want to acknowledge that um, the University of British Columbia, where I work and personally um, where I live, uh, is on the traditional territory of the Hunkaminum speaking Musqueam people. Um, and that's not just a sort of honorary mention that uh, we give in that uh, the museum I work for has been doing work with Indigenous collections for decades, uh, since before they had a physical structure. And that relationship with Musqueam is something that took my organization from an organization that worked as a typical colonial institution to something that has far better practices. Um, and I think is a world leader in terms of practices with indigenous communities. So I, I really um, hold my hands out to Musqueam as being that uh, steadfast rock that has constantly been the, the conscience of my organization and allowed me to walk into an organization that may be more ethical than a lot of museums or other organizations that I could have worked at. Um, Myself, um, my name is Jerry, Jerry Lawson. My Helchik name is Malaguse. I'm from the Helchik Nation, which is on the central coast of British Columbia. Um, I think about uh, 500, 400, 500 kilometers north of Vancouver. Um, and I'm, I can think of 50 people that would be better to be on this panel talking about language revitalization. But, um, I work, I'm not a language teacher and I'm a language learner. Uh, but I work with a program called Indigenization. I run the Oral History and Language Lab at the Museum of Anthropology, um, and we've helped to start a program called Indigenization that helps Indigenous communities digitize their own cultural heritage. And of course, those legacy recordings um, are what inform language teacher and cultural um, leaders and community um, on what um, with how to teach with integrity, what our elders wanted to pass on to us. Um, and oftentimes those recordings don't slot directly into language recordings. Sometimes they do, but most often they need to be um, interpreted by an expert, by a language teacher or by a cultural heritage, by a cultural leader in our community. Um, so I'm not a language teacher but I work with a, a large number of language teachers. Um, and I guess um, as well, I work with the First Peoples Cultural Council, which is uh, a British Columbia government, but it's indigenous managed. Um, and we manage, um, distribute the funding and do a lot of capacity development around language teaching and training in the province of British Columbia. So um, I guess I'll leave it there. Thank you, uh, Jerry. And uh, so now we continue uh, our uh, path down south. And uh, now I'll give the, the word to uh, our friend uh, Belinda uh, in Saskatchewan. You are muted. Uh, yeah. All right. Tansa, uh, Tansa Kakyo. Uh, uh, Belinda Daniels, Nisiga Sun, Neheo Mania. Um, so I am from uh, Sturgeon Lake First Nations, uh, in Saskatchewan. I, although I live in Saskatoon, Minnetonka Ski, um, which is a sev the second largest city in Saskatchewan. Um, I am the founder and one of the co-directors of the Nehiwak Language Experience, which is about 16 years old and is a not-for-profit 
uh, language revitalization organization. Um, I also have several other um, responsibilities and duties that I do um, as a Nehio second language learner and teacher of the Cree language. Um, not only do I work with the Nehiwak language experience, but I also work with the Canadian um, Indigenous Literacy Language and Literacy Development Institute, um, which is a summer institute with the University of Alberta, as well as a curriculum writer for the National um, Collaborating Center on Indigenous Education. Um, so I've been involved in language recovery work for the majority of my career um, as a teacher, um, which is about 20 years. And um, I'm also a second language adult learner. Um, and so I find, I try to find and figure out the benefits of my experience and share those lessons with other language learners. Um, I'm also very thankful for this invitation. Um, Saskatoon is situated on the territory of Treaty Number no. 6 um, in Canada. Uh, as well as the Nehiwak people, the Cree people, we have the largest land base in Canada. Um, although there are 70 different languages um, spoken in Canada among Indigenous peoples here or the first original peoples here in, um, in Canada. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm also a teacher, educator, um, curriculum writer, uh, a PhD candidate with the University of Saskatchewan in the interdisciplinary department. Um, and the areas of my study are education, anthropology, um, and history. Um, so again, I'm very pleased. Nanaskamon, hi hi. Thank you, Belinda. Um, seguimos hacia el sur, eh, viajando hacia el sur. Thank you very much. Let's continue traveling south on this journey. And now it's Biani's turn. She'll be introducing herself as well. Thank you, Henner. It's a pleasure. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. My name is Biani Mata Juarez Lopez. I'm from the southern part of Mexico, from the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. I'm from two indigenous communities, Ayug and Binitza, and I'm in the Zapotec territory right now. I don't know the right name for the people who live for the people who live there but i know that we speak isda i work with an organization known as cultural survival which is an international organization which collaborates with indigenous communities in order to seek respect for our indigenous rights and in that sense I would say that an important part of what we do is to ensure that we have the right to indigenous communication, especially through indigenous community radio. And in that sense, we've got a lot of production going on, but we also work with indigenous communities because they have their own means of communication. And so far as COVID is concerned, we've been working quite a lot on the subject and we realize the importance of the indigenous community radio as well as indigenous languages to spread the word of important uh, news to our communities as well as providing them with the pertinent information that they need in their own languages. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Biani. He's speaking in Maya. Continuing with our trip down the continent, I'd like to introduce our Mayan brother, Vicente Canche Mo, who will be taking the floor now. He's speaking Mayan. I'm very pleased to be here with you this morning and to be able to have accepted this invitation. My name is Vicente Canche Mo. Hello, Jenner, you're from the Yucatan as well. I'm in the land of the Mayas in the state of Yucatan. 
I currently live in Merida in the state of Yucatan. My profession is a professor, but I'm, my passion is to teach the Mayan language, and I have some publications in the Mayan language as well as focusing on the oral traditions. I've also been working as an interpreter and as a translator for justice issues and in education, and I've also done some translations for Amnesty International, Microsoft, Wikipedia, as well as others. And for now, I've been working on this for 25 or 30 years as a cultural promoter, and now I've been focusing on teaching the Mayan language through Facebook. I have a, a web page, which is called Código Maya, Maya Code. Thank you. And once again, I would like to thank you all for joining us from different parts of the world through Zoom as well as through Facebook Live. For those of you who are interested, we have approximately 147 participants on the Zoom platform right now, which is extraordinary for this dialogue. To begin with our exchanges of opinion, I gave my colleagues, my panelists, a series of questions so that we could start to organize the conversation, which are basically questions to inspire us. We have no intention of using them as strict guidelines for us to talk amongst ourselves, but perhaps they're one way for us to be able to share our opinions and for you to tell us how you would describe the situation of indigenous languages in the world and specifically how in your experience you've noticed that the pandemic has had an impact on the transmission or the teaching of indigenous languages the indigenous languages that you work with. So that the I've got the first question, and it goes as following. In your experience or in your knowledge, how has the current pandemic affected the teaching of the indigenous languages that you work with? So let's start with that first question. Let's start, go from south to north this time around. Let's start with Vicente. We'd like to ask him to please give us his opinion as to how he has been affected. Well, insofar as that question is concerned, I'd like to divide my response into. Institutionally speaking, the teaching of the Mayan language, in my case, for example, has been somewhat difficult because my students haven't been able to have as much contact with their teachers as we would have liked. But if you look at it from the point of view of empirical teaching, a lot of the children who are staying at home have the opportunity of practice a language in their own communities. And that's a great advantage because they have the opportunity of actually practicing their Mayan language because it's their mother tongue, which is something that we've always been seeking. Going back to the institutional side, it has been difficult. I, I know that there are a lot of communities that don't have access to internet and don't have the possibility of being connected with their teachers. And so that's when it does get somewhat complicated. It's not the same thing. I mean, I've always said that learning a language is like math. It's not just a matter of reading or looking at a text. You have to practice. You have to listen to the language. You have to practice it. You have to practice your vocal cords in with those words. And we have to be able to hear others and hear ourselves. So when you you have to do things virtually, it can be somewhat complicated. But if you analyze things, this is an opportunity because parents have had to spend more time with their children and that has also helped us to practice our language and use it more frequently i remember when i was young when i was a child and i was studying far from home and i 
only spoke Spanish. When I had to go back to my community, it was kind of tough for me to get back into the flow of the Mayan language. It took me like an hour or two to adapt and to be as fluent as I used to be in, in the Mayan language, because where I went to school, I only spoke Spanish. But now with this situation, the children are at home in their communities, they're listening to their parents and their grandparents. And so we have those two, those two paths that we've been taking. The institutional side, where yes, the number, things haven't been so successful, but in terms of what's happening in our homes, I think it's an ideal situation for us to be able to learn our indigenous languages, our mother tongues. Thank you, Vicente. On, on the chat, they were making a suggestion to see if people want to introduce themselves, not, not here on the virtual session, but you can all say hello through the chat that you see up on the Zoom screen. At the bottom, it says chat, and if you want to say hello to anybody, introduce yourselves, you would be, we would be happy to say hello to you in that chat box, all right? Okay, so continuing with this first round, talking about the current situation, I'd now like to ask Biani to please tell us what she has noticed. Thank you. Oh, I, I, I forgot to mention that I'm also a project manager for Keepers of the Earth Fund, and that fund has a series of collective projects well, they're actually all uh, collective and community projects that we finance. Well, in so far as the question is concerned, yes, we have seen a lot of changes because the interpreters, the communities have seen that their collective spaces have been much reduced. Because of COVID-19, we can't meet in large gatherings, we can't have gatherings pretty much of any type. And so most of the communication we have usually is in a collective we, in which we have a lot of people coming together. And so that has been very negative for us, for our work, because the communities, there are different types of communities, but language is very important for many of these projects because since we're all together and we're coming together, we have the opportunity of exchanging our opinions in the same language. And so this has had an impact on our projects. We've had to uh, re-engineer some of our projects to hold other types of activities and the communities that have been affected by COVID, well, well they've actually had to abandon some of their activities to focus on other activities. And so, yes, it, it has been, it has had a negative impact on our collective efforts. And that's been difficult for our communities because we're used to decisions and to spending time together collectively. But on the other hand, I agree with what Vicente said as well, in the sense that in spite of all of the bad things that have happened, there have been times in which families and communities have had to reconnect. And what we've noticed is that this is an enormous movement of people. Uh, uh, we've seen a lot of return migration from what we've heard from the communities with which we work. And so the children who have to spend most of their time with their grandparents or the families have to stay together or the migrants that have to go back to their communities create a new family um, space that's more cohesive. What's more, that's my case. I'm back in my community, and so I'm a lot closer right now to my parents, and I'm also in the learning process, and in that sense, things have been simplified. So I think that electronic means have been facilitating the process because there's been a lot of exchange on the social media so that, I mean, for those of us at least who have access to internet, We've had the opportunity of being able to talk to each other in spite of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Vianney. Experience with this, with this pandemic and the promotion of languages.
Yes, Belinda, uh, can you? Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. I your voice cut out. Um, so with the work that I've been doing uh, with the Nihiwak language experience and uh, with NCCIE and SILDI. Um, so with the Nihiwak language experience, we have had to move from face to face um, language classes to online um, since March. Um, so that took some time to figure out how are we still going to engage our community um, uh, members, people who are interested in the language. Um, so luckily, uh, there is a team of six of us and one of the individuals who I work with, uh, Bill Cook, is very um, technological savvy. Um, so we've been able to adjust our language classes, our language gatherings onto online learning, um, which has been like really successful. Uh, we have way more, maybe double, tripled the numbers um, of people wanting to learn Cree or come back to the language of Cree online. And it is because we have to make the time, we're sitting at home, um, and uh, this is an opportunity to sit and learn Cree. Um, and it's uh, free, it's available. Uh, we have amazing teachers that we work with, um, all master language teachers, um, who all still have community connections to their First Nations communities. Um, so we kind of operate in a way that is grassroots. Um, it's not a pen and paper language class. We are connecting online in real live time. Uh, we also record the, the classes so students can go back and listen and re-listen to the recording, um, which, is, which has been very helpful. Um, and so, um, during this pandemic, uh, there has been definitely um, improved changes when it comes to online learning. Um, so, so would you say would you say that that that's been the experience in general in uh, Saskatchewan, or, or um, are there um, you know shadows and lights uh, around this issue? Right, right. I would say. Um, I guess, I, I, generally speaking, um, hmm. because I'm also a school teacher with the Saskatoon Public School Division, not everybody has access to computers um, or the internet service uh, in their homes. So in that way, for me, teaching the language hasn't been effective with students, um, usually under the age of 18, um, but with adult learning, um, these people are, the, the people that I work with are very self-sufficient, so it's been different that way. And throughout the province, speaking with other teachers, um, internet and computers, um, having access to technology uh, is an obstacle. Um, so I, I suppose I could say that. Um, but with the other hats that I wear, um, online learning, um, doing the Zoom um, has been very, very effective in the work that we do in regards to um, creating language curriculum, um, language lessons. Um, uh, and I, for the most part, work 50% at home online. And so it hasn't been a real, it hasn't really affected me negatively that way. Um, and the majority of the classes that I do for the University of Alberta have been online half the time. And again, um, the situation is different from adults versus um, little children, young students um, during this pandemic. Thank you. 
Um, so Jerry, um, now we, we, we end this round with you and, and the question is, is still the same. Uh, you know, what is, what has been in your experience and the things that you have, uh, have observed the, the situation, how, how the pandemic has affected uh, the teaching and promotion of indigenous languages uh, in, over there in British Columbia? Yeah, I think my experience has been, I've seen everything that the pe people so far have been talking about um, manifesting online. And um, I think like Belinda, like everybody, I wear a lot of hats. So you could approach this from any number of directions um, in that uh, with indigenization, um, we're mainly um, working with uh, practitioners and information professionals and language teachers and helping people to digitize. And the sort of issue there is that when the pandemic hit, everybody had to go work from home and you can't really digitize when the collections are all at your place of work. So um, we were in the middle of um, a pretty major project developing new resources for new formats for helping people to digitize. And we had three um, regional workshops in the province planned um, that already had dates. One was a week out when we were sort of forced to cancel our workshops, but then very quickly we were all sent home from work as well. Um, so um, we were going from something that was in really rapid development and had people signed up for these workshops um, to there wasn't that much of a point in following the same trajectory because every, nobody was going to be at work for a while. Um, so we've been sort of digging a little bit deeper into developing our um, resources, which are manuals and guides to help people digitize, buying guides for people, tell people how to get equipment that's appropriate for digitizing your cultural heritage. Um, and I think all people who work in language and work in capacity development um, have online classes as a part of their um, of what they're looking at. So what we've done is sort of advanced that in our roadmap and started to look at um, developing online classes. And what I'm seeing from my network of language teachers in the First Peoples Cultural Council is that um, that when the, when it first hit and when people had to socially isolate it was a big hit because almost all strategies were based around getting people together first, building community and teaching that way. And, um, and I mean, like Belinda, people teach both in small groups and community and in large groups at universities. Um, this thing is a very sort of strange scale in terms of language teaching that um, language teachers in Canada seem to do it from the, from the same people will be teaching kindergarten level and university level language classes. It's a very interesting phenomena. And, um, and so you see the same people scrambling and being extremely effective on Facebook and in other places in, in the community part of it and really scrambling to scale up their online classes um, for uh, the larger groups, I think, and the more sort of um, disparate groups. And I, I think the, what works and doesn't work is a part of our second question. So um, I think we'll probably just leave it off there. And and very quickly, the First Peoples Cultural Council does a tremendous amount of capacity building for Indigenous language practitioners. And they also were in the middle of a lot of different grant cycles and training. And they've had to do a lot of work on how to keep their employees safe, but also keep communities effective during this very strange time. So. Um, hopefully we'll be able to fit in a little bit about what they're doing. So thanks. Thank you, Jerry. Um, y efectivamente, uh, la, la siguiente pregunta uh, que tenemos. As Jerry para... just mentioned, we have a second question for this session, and let's begin with Biani. The second question refers to something that I think you, some of you, have already begun to mention, in which you spoken to us about your realities and your experiences over the past almost six months now. And so the question we all ask ourselves and for which we probably all have a variety of answers, not just on your part, but also from the virtual audience, is that in the midst of this reality in which personal contact, visits, meetings, all of these have been seriously constrained. Do you believe 
or have you noticed that online communication, digital communication is, has been effective in this effort to revitalize our indigenous languages? I think Belinda and Jerry, to a great deal, have already explained to us what they've noticed. So I would just like to know what you think, Biani. Can you please share with us what you've noticed and what perspectives and what comments you would make as to how this digital world has how this digital world has changed us? Well, insofar as my work is concerned, I think there have been changes. We've We've, we've had to work a lot more than we used to in many ways. We have a variety of programs and projects, but in terms of pro, um, developing information for the community regarding COVID, that was something that we had to work on. It was an emergency. We had already been producing information with the collaboration of the radio communities that we work with. But yes, we also had to find additional ways of connecting with other organizations and individuals. So because of this, we've had to ramp everything up. All of the communication we've been doing has been through the either the internet or the phone. It's taken up a lot of our time, but we've managed to produce products in 75 different countries in 75 different languages, all of that thanks to the internet. And so we have a series of programs in that sense. In, we've also been working on indigenous radio rights. It, that's another area we've been continued to work on. And without this vi virtual world, this would not have been possible and the connection between the virtual and the radio world. In any case, we tend to work online anyhow. We're an organization that has people working all over the world. And so that experience was something we were already familiar with. And I, I know that there are a lot of other organizations that have had some trouble in adapting to working at home and distance work, for example, but we had a lot of experience with that and that has helps facilitate our process. And we've also, it's also been good for helping us to focus on the needs we had already been aware of. And so insofar as the radio is concerned, the radio efforts that we have already been financing, we've simply started to work on them directly with internet. And we've been also financing radio systems in other countries so that they can talk about COVID in indigenous languages. So it's been a very positive result. The, the collaboration has been very positive in the development of interpreters and translators as well to help us with the production of all of this information in all of these languages. And the response on the internet has been fantastic. Fortunately, we've had the collaboration of a lot of people in from our communities. This project, which came up very suddenly has had very positive results in that sense, I would say. And fortunately, we were also able to use the internet, the phone, and WhatsApp for that matter. Uh, particularly for the work I do, the Keepers of the Earth Fund has used WhatsApp very significantly with our for our work because we've also been trying to find financing for organizations or for communities that produce information, but they don't have indigenous radio available to them. So to be able to share that information has been basically using WhatsApp for those who have that option available to them. But in any case, it's still very important. There are communities or people who go to other towns, for example, so that they can have access to internet and to communicate. And that has been very helpful in that sense. And since this all began, I've noticed that there has been a wide variety of information available from many organizations within this context, which is precisely what we were looking for. 
trying to revitalize our language and and it, it, it has made our languages much more actively involved so the covid context has helped us with the production of information regarding covid so that we can learn about possible uses for plants help you with the detection of covid we've uh, produced videos and audio uh, info infography for example in indigenous languages all the way from Ecuador, for example. I think we've been very fruitful in that sense and it's been very effective and practical. Thank you. Thank you, Vianney. And the same question would be posed to my colleague, Vicente. In your experience, have you noticed the same thing or what, what would you say has happened to online communication or digital communication due to COVID? And, and to what degree are they effective? Or do you think these technologies have been effective in helping us to uh, revive and revitalize our languages? Would you like to add anything in that sense? Yes, of course. Well, I think we should also bear in mind that maybe three months ago, a lot of teachers, we didn't even know what Zoom was. We didn't know what a webinar was, all of that. So all of a sudden, we had to learn everything. We had to learn all these new technologies that now help us to participate in this conference, for example. So if that happened to the teachers, who up to a point are trained in these types of technologies. Can you just imagine what has happened with the families of the children that we work with? For example, I work with elementary school children. Can you imagine what has happened there with the elementary school children or the middle school children and their families? That's one point. And also, sometimes there are certain public policies that affect our communities, for example, there was this program in Mexico called Connected Mexico. And we didn't have equipment. And when all of a sudden we needed free internet and connections, those communities no longer had that equipment available to them. So in my experience, in my part of the world where I work with, I, where I work with 1,300 children approximately, between 25 and 30% of the children were unable to be contacted which is what, 500, 600 children who were unable to be served. And so the same thing happens with our indigenous languages. I think that usually what we've done has been working, has, has been to work with NGOs or private organizations, not institutionally. But when you talk about the internet, you also realize that there's a big difference between the information generated by governments and the information generated by others. And so in this quarantine in which we find ourselves, we've realized that, I mean, as teachers and as stakeholders, that we now have more time to explore these new options so that we can create new content. It has also helped us so that those of us who were previously uninterested because we didn't have time or whatever reason to start to have curiosity about other things. So there are advantages and disadvantages to this situation. What is very clear to me is that using technologies have opened new channels of communication and new ways to teach indigenous languages, but they also once again can hamper those communities who do not have access to them. And so those who do have access to an internet have the possibility of continuing to evolve and to continue to develop, whereas those communities that were still far flung and distant will still be very far removed from that type of opportunity. Thank you.
Thank you, Vicente. I, I agree that the results are ambivalent. in mind some, some of these uh, shadows and lights when it comes to uh, digital technology. And you were just about to, to begin unraveling your, uh, your perspectives. And uh, so I invite you to, to, do, to do so now. And you, know, you can uh, share with us, uh, you know, how, how do you perceive these this trends? You know, what is the effectiveness or uh, lack thereof of uh, you know, using, uh, continue using digital uh, technologies and digital communication to promote uh, um, and teach uh, indigenous languages in your experience? Um, yeah, I think the, there's been a lot of discussion about um, technology before COVID ever hit. And, um, and I think there's a tension between technology and conferencing and remote learning versus gathering people together. And I think um, in some cases we invest too much in developing tools and not enough in network and community building. But um, I, th um, I think there's, there's an issue of having too few people who are able to teach language and who, um, that at the moment in most of our communities, we have one or two people who um, do all of the heavy lifting in terms of communicating and teaching and developing content. And I don't think there has to be that much work before learners can pick up and start, to, um, like Vincente said, content is one of the big things that is uh, sort of missing in daily discussion. Um, I do think that, that in my Facebook feed, in my experience, I'm seeing a lot of effective teaching going on um, from all over the place. And um, I have so, again, I could have 50 of my friends would be better on this panel than I am to speak directly to the issue of teaching. but. Um, but I do, what I'm seeing again is that uh, we all are following some model of trying to communicate. And when that's interrupted, we have to scramble. So I'm seeing a lot of stress and tension to the people who have to teach, but I'm seeing a lot more daily conversational communication and questions about language in my Facebook feed that I didn't see before COVID and before social isolation and before sort of coming back to our family groups. So I'm, I'm really kind of hardened by, um, like, I, I feel for language teachers. I feel for the people who are, um, again, for me, it was a little bit easier because all the people I work with had to go home and weren't able to be effective in the things that I'm helping them do. So it let me hit the reset button and do a little bit more work um, on a more sane timeline than I've been able to work on before. So it's been a little bit helpful in that way to me. But I think for other people who have to completely change the way they do things, I think they've done a fantastic job. And I think, I don't know if Belinda would agree, but within Canada, I think we're a little bit better off technology wise than in a lot of places. We still have bandwidth problems in our smaller communities, but most people have phones and most people have mobile. And um, I think that people are being gravitating towards things like Facebook and WhatsApp and things that are available on mobile platforms. So most of what I'm seeing in terms of teaching doesn't require a full computer or fast processor, or um, we're not yet seeing a lot of um, things that require language recognition. Although, you know, in the next question, hopefully we can talk a little bit about that, so. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. And, and yes, Belinda, uh, you know, uh, finishing this round with you, um, you started um, your uh, intervention by saying that, um, you know, COVID um, has in, in, in a way uh, also forced your organization and your teaching practice into uh, unknown territory. Um, but on the other hand, you have found that uh, uh, because of the uh, digital tools that are available and the, the, the communication system that is in place, uh, at least in, in Saskatchewan, uh, this has not um, stopped the promotion, this has not stopped the teaching, but it has moved it to, to, a, to, a, different, to a different space. And uh, so, so now you are, I understand by looking at, at your website that um, most of the um, live interactions that you used to have before um, live, you know, or uh, in the flesh, as, as it said, um, now happens in uh, online uh, or through these virtual platforms. So how, uh, what, is, what is the reach, you know, what is the, what is the potential, you know, how far um, can this technology be 
used in this way and, and what are the limitations as well? Okay, um, thank you. Um, I would have to say um, lots of things go through my mind in regards to technology and indigenous language revitalization. Um, technology is a double-edged sword when it comes to our languages. Um, technology can never replace um, like our speakers, our, um, our, the people who have the language. Um, that when we're in a face-to-face -face context, we embody the language, um, the gathering of people themselves create a, a mood, they create an energy, a synergy amongst us. So technology cannot tap into that. Uh, and that's what is most missed by myself when in the language context with a gathering of people. Um, Technology um, does have benefits such as bringing the youth involved in um, creating language apps, learning from apps, uh, learning from websites, uh, de most definitely. Um, so technology can be used in multiple ways to teach, preserve, document, etc. And so that's what I'm finding. This is why I say it's a double-edged sword. Um, while at the same time, COVID here in Saskatchewan, um, the boundaries or some of the, the restrictions have been lifted. So we can have small gathering, um, gathering of peoples now, but there's still some caution because uh, we don't know um, where the, where the other people are coming from. So with the Nehiwak language experience at the end of July is our, our annual language gathering. And we have people come from all over Canada, um, as far as Switzerland and France come. So obviously we're not gonna have that going on um, because of the restrictions of the pandemic. Um, so we have moved online. Uh, we do have about 40 people registered and we're going to be a, be doing a Zoom webinar or a Zoom, Zoom classes just like this, but with 40 people. So we are going to miss that human interaction embodiment. Um, um, and so that's what I have to say about that. Um, but with the small gatherings and the teachers that I get to work with, with the not-for-profit and with NCCIE and SILDI, we are, you know, we set time. We're gonna talk for an hour and um, we don't have any interruptions, just like right now what we're doing. And so we are able to regenerate um, indigenous knowledge in regards to the language that I speak, which is Nehewewen. Um, So that has been uh, definitely, effective and um, most improved, as opposed to meeting face-to-face -face and having all kinds of worldly interruptions and the cell phone um, ringing, et cetera. Thank you. And, and just to tell you, in, in case you haven't noticed uh, that there's a, there's a very lively conversation happening in the chat of the, of the Zoom platform, uh, you know, uh, many of the points of view that uh, you have expressed have found resonance with, with other participants and with other members of the audience uh, who have been sharing with us, um, you know, uh, the agreement and, um, you know, uh, and also talking to each other. So this is, this is also quite, quite an interesting um, uh, side uh, to, to, this, to this discussion, right? So, so uh, just as we are talking about you know the limitations of online communication. At the same time, we 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 are also. I mean, I guess we we all are quite appreciative of uh, of the uh, possibilities, right? Of, of the of the richness that it also brings uh, at at some level, right? And I think that in general, people um, find uh, uh, strong points 
of coincidence uh, in, in all of the things that, that you have said, because they also um, reflect or, or they are uh, expressing um, their opinions, reflecting about their own context, and, and, and all of those are uh, as diverse as you know many of the perspectives that have been shared here. Yeah. So now, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Um, yes, I do. Yes. Want to, uh, yeah, I do want to add um, with the face-to-face -face, uh, interaction. Um, another really important point I just wanted to bring up quickly is that because we work with a team of like language speakers and teachers, um, we never really get tired. Um, there's not really any of this like drag time that you often that I often pick up when I'm on Zoom too long. Uh, I just wanted to point that out. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. So now we move to the third question of uh, of this of this conversation, and you know I'm I'm really happy that you know it has moved quite um, uh, smoothly. I, I think anyway, um, because uh, I I think that there are um, important points of of coincidence. Um, you know we have examined you know commented quite briefly about uh, the the experiences that we have had. Uh, things that we are witnessing right now um, that we are observing, uh, but if we were to uh, think in you know in terms of the future, um, and this is the third question that I you know will invite you to to consider, um, uh, what kind of experiences uh, of the ones that we know, or or you know what, what or what elements of the of the projects that we are leading right now, um, we think that should or um, are actually uh, uh, illuminating um, possibilities for the future. Which, one, which ones of the experiences that we have right now we would like to improve? Um, or which one of the projects that we know, projects that we have also seen online probably uh, during all this time that we have been in lockdown, um, we would also like to see develop uh, further. Um, entonces, la, la, la pregunta para comenzar, <coughs> me gustaría invitar a, a Vicente. Com On comenzar. this occasion, I would like to ask Vicente to start with the round of responses. In your experience with Maya Code, Código Maya, and the online experiences that you have had on Facebook, in addition to perhaps other experiences that you're aware of online, basically, I assume, over the past few days. Have you noticed that there might be some opportunities for you to focus on in the future in terms of using technology or digital technology to teach languages? Are there any future projects? perhaps that you might feel could be developed? Well, I think something is missing for us to continue to work well on all of this, which is the professionalization of everything that we're doing. As I said previously, sometimes the things we do are done in a very uh, particular fashion, bearing in mind the resources we have at hand. Resources that you have available to you or that are provided by the government or NGOs or whatever. But a lot of the work that we've been doing right now has been pretty much empirical and with the resources at hand and whatever we can find on internet and on media, social media. In my case, with when we started to promote the teaching of the Mayan language, I gave an introductory course in 2006, but it wasn't made that public until 2008. Back then, I realized that it would be important to use technology in order to be able to teach indigenous languages because I would always see that children were playing on the internet and playing with all of these systems and so i thought it would be important to develop activities that would be fun for them so that they could learn the language and now with the lockdown 
to tell you the truth, I hadn't really planned on doing anything until I realized that other colleagues were using social media and I thought, well, why don't I teach Mayan, the Mayan language on the internet? And that's when I, I, I learned how to speak to the camera all by myself. And it was strange because I was so used to talking to a group of people face to face. And now I had to just talk to myself with the camera in front of me. And so I realized that there were other programs. I met other people and what they were doing. And then I asked them to please assess my work to tell me how I was doing. Because yes, what I provide is free of charge, but that doesn't mean it has to be low quality. We have to be able to improve on what we do to make sure that the final product that we offer is a quality product, high quality product. And that would also be something that would appeal to institutions and all the stakeholders so that they would be interested in developing content as well. And in that sense, when we develop something, we have to do it as well as possible in the best way possible. In my case, if I just focus on the books published by the program that we have here from the authorities for the promotion of indigenous languages, all the books are are black and white, just words, letters, not, nothing with colors, nothing with cartoons or pictures to appeal to children, for example. And that's a big risk because if you look other types of communication for children, it's full of color, something that's very appealing to children or to young people. So what I would like to do in the future is to make sure that we have quality products, that we can be as professional as possible at what we're doing. I've always said, for example, that indigenous peoples, we don't want more than what others have. We simply want the same opportunities that others have always had. Because if you take a look at what everybody else has, I assure you that we would be able to produce things as beautiful as those produced by others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vicente. And I agree. As you said, for many of those who have started to work on digital promotion of the teaching of indigenous languages, it would be great if we could get feedback from our peers to see what we could improve on, to improve our processes of, for teaching languages, which I think is very important. I think that the same, the same question can be, can be posed to uh, the people in the, uh, in the north. Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll invite uh, now Jerry to, to share with us um, his perspectives, uh, you know, about about this particular question. Uh, that that is, you know, what uh, of the of the things that we have seen in this in this last month um, represent opportunities, or uh, do you think set future trends uh, in the use of digital technologies uh, for indigenous languages? Um, thank you. Uh... Uh, first, like Belinda, I want to um, return to the last question just very briefly. Uh, there was a story shared with me from the First Peoples Cultural Council, um, the Pacific Association of First Nations Women, who are a diaspora group who teach in an urban setting away from their traditional territories, uh, Cree and Ojibwe, um, are being funded and um, and mostly are, are not using technology and found were really stressed out by the um, lack of abil ability to meet. And they have transitioned to online Zoom meetings. Um, and the quote uh, that I was sent was, uh, we have now grown and evolved in ways that we um, wouldn't have, and now our reach is so much greater. It really pushed us to say, okay, this is hard, but how do we support each other? I don't believe we would have done it without this push, and in the long run, we're going to be able to serve and support so many more people on their language learning journey with better tools to do it. Um, so again, just to acknowledge the language teachers and people who aren't necessarily used to technology, which a lot of our language teachers aren't. Um, and the resilience is amazing within our language teaching and learning communities. So I just want to acknowledge that with that story that was shared with me. Um, and in terms of what 
technologies to pursue. Um, I've seen Heather Suter quite active in the chat. She's uh, um, working with the, uh, another collaboration with the Indigenous Language Technologies Project Canada. Um, I would say it's not an either or. It's, it's not a menu choice of what we pursue. It's exactly what Vincente said in all of it. In that, um, and going back to um, what, um, let me just make sure notes, um, Chantel said at the outset, Indigenous people are underrepresented in, in the digital realm. In that um, we need to, I think the normalization of online collaborations, not just in Indigenous, but sort of globally is making the tools better. It's making the um, ability to support those communications better. Um, so it's radio, it's um, speech to text, it's, um, you know, automatic translation tools, um, you know, hello Google, Alexa, Siri, all of that is what we should have. Um, all of that is what we should have for our communities. And um, as these things develop, they become more democratic. And so instead of saying, I want a better this, um, I would say that um, we should use all the mainstream platforms we should teach in person, we should teach online. Um, and I think a big part of that is investing in language and getting it so that we have more teachers. Um, I mean, I think that's the biggest thing to me is that we've always been resilient, we've always been creative. The technology gap is shortening, I believe, at least in Canada. Um, but we need to invest in all of the technologies and we need to invest in language teachers. So it's not an either or for me, it's not a menu choice, it's not a um, and I would like to point out that um, Zoom made themselves free during the COVID crisis, but we don't know what it's going to cost to keep doing this once this crisis ends. And I mean, I, I think a lot of us have become really dependent on Zoom. So I think advocacy is a big thing for us right now in starting to look at these digital tools, look at what they cost and trying to tell people ethically, make these things free to Indigenous language teachers long term, forever. Um, uh, I mean, that, that to me is the big thing, is that we're starting to use these tools, we're figuring out how to use them. We'll return to an in-person um, soon enough, like it's, it will happen. Um, and you can't keep Indigenous people from hugging each other, it just happens. But, but right now we're really taking to these tools quickly and I'm, I applaud the language teachers, but we need to advocate for their continued free use. So, um, and investment in developing more advanced language technology so that we're not 10 years behind, you know, once we've caught up in all these other ways. So I guess not very specific, but that's my, so. Oh, that's great. Because I think that, uh, uh, I mean, we focus a lot on, on technologies, but, um, but, but, you know, there's, there's something um, much more complex uh, that uh, actually sustain the technology. I mean, as, uh, as, as Belinda was saying uh, before, I mean, technology is a double-edged sword uh, because on the one hand, it facilitates things, uh, makes things uh, more uh, readily available for a lot of people. But on the other hand, it has, um, it has the effect of replacing uh, uh, people at, at the same time, you know, something that uh, is of concern not just for indigenous uh, peoples or for indigenous nations, but also for for many other sectors of the population worldwide. I mean, there are several discussions about the um, the automatization uh, and you know uh, uh, what will come with it. Uh, but I digress. So just just coming back, just just acknowledge that that I I I see the complexity and and I appreciate uh, that people are you know people who work with technology. Uh, uh, also uh, see that complexity in relation to to their own work, and you know, and, and, and are actually quite conscious that technology it's not the panacea. Uh, but, you know, we will we'll always need people, uh, at least in the foreseeable future, to manage that technology. Um, but uh, continuing with this exercise of thinking uh, about you know what can we do in the immediate future with technology? I mean, what what are the what are the pathways that we can perhaps continue exploring now that we have been forced into that into this sort of situation or you know given the fact that we have had all of this experience before um 
and now we are in a, in, in a new state. Um, I will invite the Belinda now to, to also answer that question, you know, what, what, what technologies for the future, what, uh, what do you think um, could be the new trends, uh, thinking about um, how to make them more effectively, uh, more effective, sorry, um, uh, for the promotion, teaching, uh, uh, revitalization of indigenous languages. Right, right. Um, I was um, thinking about uh, Candace Gala's work, uh, written in 2016. Um, she makes a mention in regards to uh, Indigenous language, Indigenous language revitalization no longer exist, and our languages no longer exist in isolation because of technicity, because of technology. And we can use this as a as a uh, support mechanism in regards to language revitalization. Um, and, and we have been doing that. And again, that's an, a wonderful example of our resilience. And at the same time, the intellectual capacity that we have as Indigenous peoples for our language spirits uh, uh, across, the, across the globe. Um, I do want to make a couple of mentions in regards to opportunities and future trends. Um, so again, I've said that I'm from Sturgeon Lake First Nation um, in Saskatchewan. Uh, I work with a, a, with a group of boys, uh, ages uh, usually uh, 10 to 16, 10 to 15. And so what I've been seeing with these group of boys, with our small gatherings, is that there is more of a one-to-one -one, uh, learning and at the same time um, we're able to uh, record videotape uh, specific um, ways of knowing and ways of doing and so i am so just to give you an example i'm planning a um, a land-based course with um, tanning hides uh, turning hides into leather, into like making, um, you know, like moccasins and jackets. And so I have a group or I have a couple of youth who will come and record um, this process uh, with a language speaker. And we're able to document this. And this is how we're using um, technology in the language for a small group of people and able to uh, upload it on YouTube. So this is a trend that I see happening um, all over social media, is that people are being engaged on the land with the language that they speak and sharing that with the world. And I think that is an amazing trend. Um, and on top of, of an, another trend that I'm seeing, um, with the Nihiwak language experience, we've taught hundreds of participants. We have taught hundreds of learners, um, even thousands if all six of us count all the students that we've taught in our lifetime. And so what we've done now is over the, for the past, over for the past year and a half, because I find ways of knowing and ways of being and ways of doing central to my identity. We um, now have this uh, collaborated massive prayer that we do Monday nights at nine o'clock p.m. Saskatchewan time. And so it doesn't matter where we are on Turtle Island in Canada, we all pray at the same time to the Nehio language spirit. And so I've seen this as a trend happening during COVID especially, um, and praying to the language spirit that our, that our languages flourish, that the language spirit comes back into our homes and our communities, uh, among the people. Um, and so it's really important, even though we're talking about technology and the technicity of it, that we're still very much a prayer people, a ceremonial people, um, an experiential people um, that we include ceremony in in our practices that that we're doing 
And so I see, I see that as an opportunity to, um, that's been happening during um, this pandemic. And so I just wanted to add those little things to, to this third question. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you very much. I, I think that that's really important. And now we uh, we are approaching the the end of this uh, you know fascinating, extraordinary as I said at the beginning, uh, conversation. Uh, y para terminar, uh, bueno, con, and con to esto. conclude with this third round, and perhaps to get back to some other points afterwards. I would like to ask Vianney to also please share with us what she's perceived in terms of opportunities and trends, future trends in terms of the use of digital technologies. Thank you. So, uh, well, I don't know if I'm going to be talking about digital technologies as much as about the fact that this pandemic has told us, has taught us that we need to continue to work with radio in our indigenous communities because a lot of our communities are in places where they have no access to internet or even electricity for that matter. We use solar panels in these very remote communities. And the same applies for not so remote areas where they perhaps don't have that much internet or in other places where people do have the opportunity of having apps and listening to a lot of things over the internet. So I think that that's an important point to bear in mind, to remember that the radio already exists. It's available to everybody. And within this COVID uh, context, radio continues to be very important to promote indigenous languages, particularly when there's no other means of communication. I recall, for example, there's one project in which we're working with Costa Rica where they don't have a radio, but what they do is they have a public uh, loudspeaker, let's say, and that's where they make announcements regarding COVID in indigenous languages. And that's also something that is, is translated from Spanish into the indigenous language, the local indigenous language so that they can broadcast not just information regarding COVID, for example, but a lot of other subjects, but in indigenous languages in the PA system. So that's what I would say. And I perhaps would also add that our productions are oftentimes available on internet. We share them on internet. And I think that's important too, to recognize those languages and to recognize the importance of other languages and make all of this information available on our websites. That would be very important for us to continue to do. Vicente referred to the professionalization of our work. When we wanted to develop our indigenous programs, a lot of people approached us who speak an indigenous language, either as a first language or a second language, but perhaps they're not, they, they don't know how to teach the language or they don't know how to translate certain terms because they're just used to speaking their language. With the COVID programs, we noticed that that was happening. We don't, we are unable to teach the language. We're not into that side of the production. We're, we're, we're basically more focused on the radio side. And so we realized that we need to have more people available to us, more people who, who, are, who are indigenous language speakers, who they don't have to be linguists, they don't have to be professional, but to have a little bit more professionalization, maybe be taught uh, teaching methods or something so that they could help us. Because I think that there would be a lot of potential there. Jerry also referred to the wide range of options that we have available to us. And in our organization, Keepers of the Earth Fund, as well as Cultural Survival, we've always thought about the importance of using different sources, radio, face-to-face, -face, whatever. And radio in particular is very important for many communities. 
and sometimes it's not enough just to create a um, infogram or have a radio program or have an app we have to be able to use all of those options have them all available to us and i think that's very interesting and important to to bear that in mind and to know that all of that is available thank you thank you Vignani. and well as i was saying we're approaching the end of the event the this conference was going to take an hour and a half and i think we're running out of time but before concluding, I just wanted to have uh, all of you make your final remarks with a really, really quick final remark from all of you as part of this exercise. And I would like to thank the sponsors of this meeting. I would like to thank the Canadian Embassy in Mexico and Rising Voices as well. But to conclude our event, I would like to ask all the panelists to give us their brief final remarks, a final message you'd like to leave us with. So let's begin with Vicente. Well then, first of all, thank you very much. I think this has been very enriching. I think everything we've heard this heard about on this morning and this early afternoon has been very interesting. And I'm sure that this will help us to improve upon the work we do for our peoples. I would conclude by saying that we shouldn't be developing internet content. We should be developing content for our indigenous peoples because that's the idea. It, the means is not important. What's important is who this content is for. If it's available on the internet, that's great. If you can find it on internet, and that's great. But what's most important is that it reach the communities, the indigenous community, so it can have an impact on them. That's the remark I would make. And Imtana, the god of wisdom, said cultivating sciences and the arts, continue to cultivate the sciences and the arts, preserve your traditions, Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. They're speaking in Mayan. Continuing with this final, these final remarks. Is that me? Yes, Belinda, sorry. Oh, can you, you hear me now? Yep, I, can hear I guess, um, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, I just wanted to conclude with, I guess, a question. Um, same with Vicente. Um, in regards to indigenous language revitalization, I would just want to have people think about what is, what is the goal for the community? What are your goals for the community? And then think about how technology can assist and support those goals. That's it. Thank you. Hi, hi. Thank you very much, Belinda. Viani, uh, si nos quieres compartir tu, tu comentario. Thank you very much, Belinda. Viani, would you like to make your final comment? Well, I think it's been wonderful to hear from you. It's always great to hear from experiences that people have had further north and in other parts of our country. I, I agree with what Vicente said in the sense that, yes, we have to focus on our communities. And in that sense, we have to assess what information we're providing them with and what we're trying to do for them. And yes, I, I agree that uh, personally, I was reading one of the chat comments in which it really touched me in the sense that we have to diversify the methods we use. I've seen that there's a lot of work that's being done by beginners, but there are also a lot of people who are experts that have been involved in the revitalization of indigenous languages. And, and so there are different levels that we can work at. I think that we've we've seen a lot of development 
of our efforts, but we we also have to find a way to to skip from the basic level to a more advanced level. I think that's something that I, I would like to do, and I hope to be able to teach others to teach. I think that's an important point we have to focus on. I've seen it in my parents, for example. My parents speak their their languages, their indigenous languages, but I always have questions as to how can we teach all of these languages using different methods. It can be difficult sometimes, especially if you learn it as a second language. So thank you, everybody. And if you ever need anything, I would be very happy to speak to any of you. Bye. Thank you, Vianney. Sorry, you cut out. Is that me? Yes, that's that's you. Sorry. I mean, <laughs> All right. For my, my connection, but but you are the privileged uh, one to to close the the meeting. So uh, yes, um, go for I it. I can't imagine why, but this is. Uh, I thank you so much, everybody, for um, sharing your experiences, and this has been a really great panel um, to be a part of. And uh, reading the chats, just so much. Um, dynamic, passionate interest in um, language. And I don't want to say technology because it's not about technology, it's about language. Um, uh, I want to say something that I didn't say earlier on that through indigenization, all of our resources are developed, are freely available online. We don't keep anything, there's no paywall. There, it doesn't, it's not restricted to BC. If we make something, download it. If you want to reach out to us, reach out to us and we'll get back to you. Um, Within the technology sphere, I would say for the language professionals, for the people who are doing this as a career, keep doing what you're doing because I just see so much movement in terms of technology, in terms of directed applications that are Indigenous developed and focused. And again, I'll go to Heather in the chat talking about it has to be Indigenous directed. And I'm making a lot of assumptions when I speak that these are the goals of community, that these are Indigenous directed technologies to a great degree because that's what I've been involved with lately. I'm not seeing outsiders swoop in and provide us with solutions to saving our language anymore. I just don't see that from my perspective. Um, so for people in different parts of the world, that's possible. It's possible for those environments to change and for you to take back control and to enter respectful collaborations with technology creators. Um, and what I'm seeing in my Facebook feed are my language, Halchikla, didn't have a keyboard. We didn't have a way to communicate on cross-platform until it was updated a few years ago. Um, and what I've seen since is increased conversational communication online and Facebook, um, people putting things out on Twitter and Instagram, and it's the result of language teaching that the community picks up and uses language. So to me, I, I see technology as something that is developed purposefully by the professionals, but the rest of it will be picked up by our communities. As they learn language, they'll use whatever they can use. And, and we're gonna see organic growth within our communities if we enable that. And it will be, again, it doesn't have to be only technology, it'll be in person and on Facebook and, and so, um, what I would say is, uh, like, keep doing what you're doing. Don't be afraid of technology, but it certainly isn't the answer. Like, technology isn't the answer. It's just another place that we live. So um, thank you, everybody. Uh, I've loved this conversation and really appreciate being here. Thank you very much, Jerry. And uh, thank you, Belinda. Thank you, Biani. Thank you, uh, Vicente. Thank you, everyone who connected today. And it has been, uh, again, a privilege. Uh, to um, sort of facilitate the exchanges and, and the conversation. And um, uh, uh, again, just to uh, very quickly to say that uh, this is the first in a series of, of conversations that we're having another uh, webinar on um, July the, th the 30th. Uh, the 30th. Uh, we will have a, our second round table, uh, which will be uh, how language uh, digital activism can play a role 
in the upcoming International Decade of Indigenous Languages, uh, which will be uh, from 2022 uh, until 2032. So, um, you know, stay tuned and, uh, and join us again uh, on, on this uh, second round table. Uh, it's in, uh, in a fortnight. Um, muchas gracias a todos los que se sumaron y, este, y los esperamos. esperamos que... Thank you to all of those who joined us in this panel session and we hope you join us once again in a fortnight when we have the second virtual session. Thank you very much. Thank you to the sponsors of this virtual meeting, which is the Canadian Embassy in Mexico and Rising Voices. Voices. See you soon.